Uh, I'll record it. There we go. Uh, so welcome everyone. Thank you for being here tonight for our event on design decision making. Uh, so whether you're like a junior designer or a senior designer, you know, being able to make, defend and rally your team behind decisions is a very important skill and one that you'll definitely want to build as your career grows. Uh, but before we jump into the event, for those that are just joining us for the first time, uh, UWUX is a student organization at the University of Waterloo uh, that is working to grow the UX and product design community. So whether you're a Waterloo student or not, um, a designer or even just someone thinking about pursuing a career in design, uh, we host like talks, events and workshops uh, for everyone. Uh, we post all of our announcements through our socials. Uh, so please follow us if you'd like to find out more about those and also join our Slack community. Uh, just to chat with other people also in the design community as well. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the night, Richard Yang. Uh, Richard is a senior product designer at Facebook. Uh, he's also a self-taught designer, having graduated from kinesiology at Waterloo in 2017. <laughs> um, in his journey, uh, he worked at companies ranging from like Sony and Shopify to even co-founding his own start small startups in Toronto. He also shares a lot of design content on his Instagram that ranges from UX principles, UI shots, to even answering questions on his IGTV. So if you have any questions, feel free to submit them in the chat and Richard will be, the, will be able to answer them throughout the talk. So, you know, just keep it conversational and be good. <laughs> so with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Richard. Cool, awesome, thanks Brandon. Give me one sec, I will share my screen. Cool. Can everyone see? Yeah, awesome. Cool. So the topic of my uh, talk today is mostly focused on um, how do you make and defend design decisions? Uh, what I hope to accomplish with this talk is to provide a mental model for decision making and also introduce some really helpful and relevant uh, topics and concepts that I feel like would be beneficial in your career as you kind of scale up in this particular area of your um, design career. So um, as some of you might know, like typically once you've hit that whole intermediate to senior milestone in career, your technical skills uh, and design excellence typically don't matter as much. And it's more focused on how you can actually influence a team, particularly around uh, product strategy and product vision. And to do that, you need to be really good at making decisions and how do you actually communicate and get people to agree with you. Um, so like the foundation of all of this is how do you make the best decisions with the information available and how do you rally the team around your vision? Sorry, cool. Um, so this is roughly the agenda for my talk. Uh, I won't read through all of this because there's a lot of content to cover within 45 minutes or an hour. Um, one last thing before I dive in is uh, I'll link the slide out to you guys if you want to see any of the notes in more detail. I have pretty comprehensive speaker notes, so don't feel like you need to take anything down. So I just realized I skipped a slide. Um, oh, also uh, near the end, I've also prepared some tips uh, specifically for early career growth um, as you're kind of getting into the field of design. So definitely ask questions um, along the way. Um, Brandon will be moderating and kind of like noting these down as we go. So uh, a bit about me, um, as Brandon mentioned, uh, I graduated from the University of Waterloo uh, back then, back in my day, a couple years ago. Design wasn't really a big thing and I didn't really know anything about it, but I kind of switched into it uh, in fourth year and I've managed to have like a pretty a uh, solid career in design, pretty rapid career growth. So I wanna like share some of those tips with you. Uh, if you have any questions about my transition, uh, definitely ask uh, as we go along, but I'll also link to my medium at the end. I've written a few uh, blog posts about like the exact process, the tips and tools I use along the way. So a bit about my um, work experience. Uh, I did a lot of visual design or marketing design at Sony PlayStation, uh, mostly focused on mobile apps and marketing design. Uh, I then moved on to product design at Shopify, where I'm mostly focused on growth and experimentation, primarily how to create um, levers for organic uh, lead generation, and also uh, developing kind of like uh, improved onboarding experiences for churn reduction. 
And then currently, as I mentioned, uh, I'm working at Facebook, uh, working within the ads and business space, primarily targeting um, how do you create more effective and engaging ads uh, for the travel industry and also for the SMB restaurant industry. Um, and then on the side, I've never done any of these like full time, but there have always been like things I've been doing like while I work. Um, I've co-founded, sold and exited several startups on the side. Um, co-founded like an innovation lab slash agency with one of my friends. Um, got like zero to 700K projected annual revenue six months in. So if you guys want any tips on, you know, how to freelance, how to price and how do you get the maximum kind of like revenue generation as like a solo designer, please feel free to ask uh, as I go along. And then as I mentioned also, I write a lot about design on Medium, post on IG and Dribbble, and also do talks and workshops like this one, and also do a lot of mentoring for aspiring designers. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, this is the general overview of um, what I'm planning to cover today. So decision-making in the context of design, um, how to use assumptions and validate them, how do you frame problems, how do you defend your decisions and get alignment within the team, and then also a couple valuable techniques I feel like would really serve you well as you uh, start in your career in design and get into decision making. So that's a Kana model and also decision logs and tripwires. And then a bunch of additional tips on how to take this further, how to like research and grow the skill set yourself. Uh, and then after the conclusion, I have some additional tips, more career advice for junior designers. So let's take a big step back and kind of like talk about the definition of design. So um, everyone defines design differently and it really reflects the type of designer you are. So like this is just my definition, but your definition might vary. Um, so I believe that design is solving human problems by making a series of informed decisions based on various assumptions. So to unpack this a little bit, what that means is um, when we always want to make uh, the best decisions possible within a given time. Um, and a lot of that time, uh, we won't have all the information that's available to make the best decision and we have to rely on assumptions. However, assumptions can be a really tricky thing and it takes a lot of work and expertise to really manage them effectively and also manage how you validate them, which is what I'll get into. Um, so at a very high level, uh, assumptions um, are basically just like um, essentially like various like inputs, data and knowledge that you have that basically uh, help sway a decision in a particular way. And in an ideal scenario, you always want to validate all your assumptions. So you have all the information at the highest amount of accuracy when making a decision. However, once you get into a workplace, this is no longer possible because you need a lot of resources to validate everything. And usually, even if you have the resources, it's not a good use of them to actually validate every tiny thing. So I'm hoping here to provide like a framework or some guiding principles on um, when you should actually validate an assumption. Um, so generally you wanna do that based off like the degree of confidence you have in that assumption um, and basically the evidence you have supporting a particular assumption and whether or not you should move forward with it. So uh, typically the forms of evidence that we operate with in industry are um, you know, universal design principles and patterns. What this means is you know, like you can make an assumption that, you know, this is the best user experience and the evidence supporting that would be like, this is a very standard thing in you know, like in material design or it's a very standard um, UI pattern that the vast majority of users are like really well accustomed to. And any deviation beyond that to whatever extent would be kind of like a strong assumption that you want to challenge. So generally this means that you want to go with very established patterns unless you have a very good case not to. Uh, the second form of evidence uh, used to kind of like validate assumptions is user research and market research. And this usually is focused around like, you know, are you solving the right problems? Um, how does this kind of like match up to existing solutions within the market? Uh, next, this is more technical and usually end or DS driven, but this is like data and that takes a form of KPIs, which stands for key performance indicators and also specific metrics. So if you have like a lot of data or evidence saying that, you know, assumption is, you know, either more or less accurate, that's something to definitely consider as you go along. And then kind of similarly along that vein, you have past experiments 
So if anyone within the org or the larger company has run similar experience in the past, that's usually very valuable information that can help inform uh, different assumptions that you do have. So um, gonna try and like pause along the way and kind of like make this a bit more interactive. So if anyone has any questions along the way, uh, please type them into the Zoom chat and then one of the moderators will stop me and um, I'll try and answer them. But hopefully everyone's with me so far. Going to do a quick two second uh, time stop in case anyone has any questions, but otherwise I'll move on. Uh, no questions so far, but everything is... Actually, we do have a question, yeah. Uh, so one question from Jaden is, do you have any recommendations for making database decisions when your company doesn't have any analytic tools set up? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, like data comes in two forms, right? There's like a lot of historical data that comes from past experimentation. So it looks like your company doesn't have that. But um, generally like data is really powerful because like it's that kind of one objective measurement that any discipline will be able to accept, especially with like, you know, eng, PM, uh, et cetera. So like, it's all about kind of like figuring out like, you know, if you're kind of like really disagreeing on a particular decision, uh, the best way forward typically is to use data. And, you just, and the easiest way to kind of like get that started is to kind of agree on an A-B test. So you can have a control, which is um, the current implementation or something that a different person is strongly pushing. And then you can like test that alongside or in parallel with um, you know, your ideas and some other ideas and then get that data to kind of answer those questions. Um, generally, yeah, like if there's a lot of, if there isn't a lot of data that's like historically there, um, it's kind of your job as a designer and also like the data scientists that assuming you partner with um, to kind of like set up tests that will help kind of like validate uh, a lot of your ideas. And typically this only needs to happen really early on. Once you build more of a working relationship and rapport with a team, um, you know, there's a lot more trust and sometimes like you don't need to validate as much, but that usually uh, comes with like more seniority as you go. Hopefully that answers your question, but if not, please follow up. Cool. Yeah. Um, so moving forward, um, uh, here are kind of like the three main factors I kind of like choose on when to validate an assumption further. So uh, this basically means that, you know, like, I mentioned before, you can't possibly validate everything, even if you have the resources to. And the best way to determine like which kind of like battles that you should like push back on are these three factors. So the first one is, what is the impact to the business if the assumption is wrong? So you know, if it has like a very critical impact to the business, like you know, loss of revenue, loss of user trust, then it's something that you want to validate, even if you're kind of sure. You want to be absolutely sure if the impact is going to be huge. The second factor is the degree of confidence in your assumptions. And this is inclusive of kind of like how much of a deviation or jump is a particular decision on a universal design principle or pattern. So what this means is, you know, like, um, let's say for iOS and Android, like typically you have like that bottom bar, you have the nav bar, you have like horizontal navigation, and you have like a lot of established components. When you make a decision to create a brand new component or deviate from a interaction model that's like highly established for a platform, you should have a really good rationale um, and supporting evidence on why you should do that. So that's kind of what I'm calling out here. And then the third uh, kind of factor to consider is like how reversible a decision is. So there's gonna be like a lot of like what we call an initial like long shots or like kind of like shots in the dark where you know like this potentially could work really well but we're not sure. However, if we test it, it's really reversible. You know, it's like gonna be an A-B test and we can just like turn it off or revert it if you know it doesn't work. Um, that's like a scenario where like you don't need to validate assumptions. But conversely, if there is kind of like a feature that, you know, is going to be like very, very hard to roll back. Typically, these are like information architecture changes or like really big pivots in product strategy and vision um, that are really hard to reverse. This is something that you definitely, definitely, definitely want to validate further with your assumptions. Um, so kind of like following along this vein, like in terms of how you approach validation, 
uh, for assumptions. There's kind of like two, here's like kind of a framework that I always use. I conceptualize assumptions in kind of two categories, proactive and reactive. So proactive validation uh, typically happens before the product is built. And this tends to be a bit more qualitative in nature and more uh, user research driven. So as I mentioned, um, the common techniques for proactive validation is user research, market research, competitive benchmarking, and it's more suited for validating assumptions at a macroscopic level. And then uh, on the other hand, reactive validation simply happens after the product is built. And this comes in the form of data, A-B testing and experimentation. And it's more suited for validating assumptions on a micro level. Um, and I just wanna call out that choosing the right validation method for each assumption is very, very critical. If you wanna like kind of like maximize um, your resource investment. So um, the kind of main takeaway here is that uh, depending on the org that you're joining, things might be you know, more design-driven or more edge-driven. And um, design-driven kind of orgs tend to gravitate more towards proactive validation and edge-driven orgs tend to gravitate more towards reactive validation. And like uh, neither is like wrong per se, but it's more about kind of understanding and appreciating the strengths and weaknesses of both types of validation and being really good at kind of calling out like, you know, this assumption should be validated proactively and this assumption should be validated reactively and communicating that with the team. Like this is one of the ways like a junior designer, designer can provide a lot of value to a team uh, earlier on and also help the team be more efficient with their resources because um, generally, anything that you can validate early on proactively, you should, because at that point, the product isn't fully built yet, and it doesn't take as much time or effort to change anything versus um, when you validate something reactively. However, certain things like very, very quantitative metrics and KPI improvements or gains need to be validated reactively. So sometimes like you'll validate things proactively first to kind of get the high level direction and validate again reactively, but usually you don't have to do both. Hey, Richard. Yep. Would you be able to provide an example of an assumption on a macro level versus assumption on a micro level? Sure. Um, so proactive validation is something that you do like before something's built, right? So like the test I always do is something called concept testing, which is a step that goes before usability testing. And concept testing is generally like very high level. You're not doing any comprehensive prototypes. It's usually just like a conceptual or vision mock-up. And then I would take this mock-up or vision kind of concept and go to potential users and be like, would you use this? So that's like a form of proactive validation that would do really, really early on before a lot of the nitty gritty details have been ironed out. And the goal of that is to just get like a really high level pulse on, you know, do users find this useful? How would they use it? So that's something I would do proactively. Uh, reactive validation would be, let's say I have a landing page and um, I want to like optimize my conversion funnel for my landing page. And let's say things like, you know, bounce rate is 50% and then the final CTA conversion rate is let's say 5%. And then I have maybe like four or five ideas on how I could modify my landing page to make it better to increase those two metrics. Those are things that I would want to validate reactively because it makes more sense like kind of like build it out first and then run like a split A-B test and see the exact quantitative differences between two or more versions. Whereas like if I were to test it uh, proactively, yes, I would do it earlier. Yes, I might save time, but it's really, really hard to kind of get like, you know, the nitty gritty details on whether or not like performance wise, this quantitatively, quantitatively will perform better. So um, it just kind of depends on like, you know, what you think needs to be validated with like real data and what you think could be validated uh, with just like a small sample of users. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect, thank you. Cool. Um, so kind of like tying in the whole assumption piece together, um, once you've kind of like figured out, uh, you know, like the decisions that you're making and also the assumptions that you want to validate, which ones to validate, the next kind of step and how to drive this home is um, alignment within the team on the actual prom. So the quote that I kind of want to leave with you guys is 
before a decision can be made, everyone must first understand a line on the problem that needs to be solved. And the reason why this is really important is because a lot of the times you'll find that the miscommunications and the misalignment and the back and forth and the differences come because of um, kind of like misalignment in terms of like the overall like high level problem that this project or feature is trying to accomplish. And a lot of the times this happens because of like discipline specific perspectives. So as a designer, you're always gonna be very focused on how do you create the best user experience. But a product manager might be more focused on how do we achieve the biggest business outcomes or how do we map this to the company's goals. Whereas Eng might be optimizing for things like performance or like integrations, et cetera. So like all these perspectives aren't wrong, but it's very important for either the designer, hopefully in your case, or a PM or someone else to kind of set everyone down and make sure that, you know, at a very, very high level, we're all aligned. Like this is a user problem that we're trying to solve with this product. And once you have that foundation, you'll find that a lot of kind of disagreements and pushback or decisions can be resolved by basically um, just like looping it back to that high level goal. Like you can use this to solve like a lot of debates um, and kind of disagreements because, you know, at the end you can always light it up like, okay, for both of our ideas, like which one brings us closer to solving this high level, high level goal. And in that case, when there's still a disagreement, then it's very, very easy to resolve that with um, like data driven validation that, you know, neither party can really like push back or disagree on. So like to that point, like when you kind of define that problem high level cross discipline with the team, you also want to align on um, the metrics of success. Like what specific tangible metrics are you gonna be able to like measure to compare like, you know, is version A or version B better? So um, that's usually something we call the North Star metric. And it's a very important metric that the team also needs to align on at very early stages to kind of ensure like a really smooth collaboration. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, we have one actually. Um, so how do you balance the following of universal design principles and or proactive validation through user research with innovation? Uh, for example, when Apple released the iPhone, people mm -hmm. were originally opposed to the idea of typing via touchscreen. Mm -hmm. If Apple had conducted user research or followed the principles at the time, they would have never chosen to push forward an idea so innovative. That was from Jaden. Yeah, um, that's a really, really good question. So like it's always gonna be a balance, right? Like these are principles and guidelines, but you always have to like think about what makes sense for you. So on the Apple example, like the first thing to think about is like, you know, most people that deviate from patterns actually do fail. Like patterns are established for a reason. There's a ton of laws out there for like why something should be done a certain way, even if like there's an objectively better usability kind of driven solution. If it's like established, people are just like really, really resistant to change. So it takes a tremendous amount of effort and also like brand power, like Apple to really push and innovate something brand new. That being said, um, uh, the vast majority of established design patterns solve a very specific problem like decently well. Um, there's a really common saying kind of in the tech world where like something needs to be two to three times better or 200 to 300% better for somebody to actually make like a change to adopt it. So if your solution is incrementally better by like, you know, 10%, 20%, even 50%, that's usually not enough. So um, you really need to like kind of take a step back and think about, you know, um, is there like a brand new use case or need or pain point that's emerged where like existing patterns are no longer suitable. Is this an opportunity to innovate? Usually that means yes. But if you're doing like a very, very incremental improvement for a very niche use case, then you really wanna think about the trade-offs and balances between innovating a completely new pattern versus using an existing pattern that works like, okay. And to that note, like you have to prioritize your efforts as well, right? Typically when doing a brand new product or brand new feature, it makes sense to do kind of like more of the status quo first and get a baseline. 
And then you can reactively validate a lot of new ideas that you have through A-B testing. That way, um, you always have like control. That's like the industry standard. And then you have kind of like this playground that allows you to test a lot of new ideas, but um, never kind of impacting the core business because ideally you'd be running like multivariate A-B tests. So you'd roll out like your new ideas, like 1% of the user base at a time eventually expanding that's like a more methodical way of approaching things but i don't want to like deter you into like you should never innovate new things but i'm just saying that you should have like a very 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 good reason to change an established pattern um unless there's like significant like multiple like two to three times improvement in performance or usability does that make sense Got the thumbs up. Yep. That was good. Cool. Nice. Um, so uh, there's kind of two techniques here for how to frame a prom. Uh, so the first one is the job to be done framework. A lot of people know or have heard of this topic, but I feel like um, there's a lot of misconceptions on how this actually works. So I'll try and like untangle some of that here. Um, to kind of introduce the topic, there's a really, really good quote that I think that I think captures the essence. Basically what it's saying is upgrade your users, not your product. Don't build better cameras, build better photographers. And this is a quote from Katie, uh, Kathy Sierra, really famous uh, game developer slash designer in the US. Um, and what this is trying to say is that, you know, everyone like has a goal when they interact with your product and their end goal is to not simply use your product to its maximum potential. Their goal is to still accomplish something. And generally, like if you have a decision trade off between empowering your users versus extending the functionality of your product, um, you always want to empower your users. Like make your users like as powerful as possible. Um, let give them like all the tools, resources, and support they need to actually accomplish like their end goal. Figure out what their jobs to be done actually is, because it's never to use your product; it's to accomplish something. And at initial glance, it might seem like these two things are very similar, but the more you think about it, the less similar they are. And I'll kind of like dive into that in my next slide. So job to be done focuses on the mechanisms that cause a user to adopt innovation. So this kind of highlights the fact that, you know, like all user adoptions, like based off like pain points and goals and objectives, um, Job to be done is just like a way to kind of like zoom in on kind of like why they're willing to use your product and how do you take that one step further. So this is a really good framework because it helps reframe the discussion around what's best for the user and not what's best for a particular feature or product. So um, I'll have some examples kind of following this, but some other tips on how to apply this in practice is use jobs to be done and job stories instead of user stories. Um, typically user stories is kind of more of a legacy format that a lot of older companies use. It's simply not very good nowadays. Uh, and it usually comes in the format of, you know, as a user, um, I want to do X, which is the action, so that Y happens, which is the outcome. Um, and this is a really bad format because it makes a lot of assumptions on the persona and the action. Generally, like user stories are written without a lot of in-depth user research. And um, it kind of like almost sets like a false anchor towards what you should be prioritizing. Um, it doesn't really dig deep into the actual user problems as much, which is why I prefer like the job story format instead. And um, usually how that is structured is when X happens, I want to do Y so that expected outcome can actually happen. Um, and then just to drive this point home, uh, users never want features, they want outcomes. So it takes a bit of kind of like mental reframing, but as a designer, you should always be thinking about, you know, um, how do you achieve the outcome and not how do I create the best feature just because you know the PM or the roadmap tells me to. Like you always want to like validate and double check that whatever you're designing, whatever you're building, actually does like achieve the outcome that we think users want. And that's sometimes like assumptions I need to validate earlier on. 
sorry, a quick water break. <clears throat> So um, here are two examples. Um, the first one's for non-tech, the second one's for tech. So the non-tech example is for a herbicide business, um, a bad user story would be uh, farmers want the most effective weed killer. And this is bad because it's focusing or doubling down into the feature or product, which is the weed killer. However, um, a better way of framing this from using the job story method is farmers want to prevent weeds from impacting crop harvests. So the distinction here is that if you were to go off with the bad user story, you would end up optimizing on creating the best weed killer, right? But this leaves like a lot of room for your company or product or feature to be disrupted by other people focusing on the actual problems, which would be how do you prevent weeds from impacting crop harvests? And you might find that if they were to take this prompt statement instead, they might come up with a better solution um, that doesn't involve using weed killer. Does that make sense? So like if you frame a problem, pro if you frame your problem properly, you open up a lot more possibilities for potential solutions that could be much better than, you know, let's say the local maxima that you end up with if you were to use uh, user stories. <clears throat> so another example for Apple is um, bad would be, you know, runner, runners want to uh, listen to, want to use an iPod to listen to their music. This kind of zooms in on kind of iPod being the solution and music as a feature without actually considering the user goals or the user outcomes they actually want. So um, a better way of framing this would be runners want to motivate themselves and set their pace while listening to music. So this opens up a lot more possibilities in the scope of the potential, you know, solution you come up with because, um, you know, they might come up with something that isn't the iPod or isn't an app. Any questions here? Uh, no, no questions so far. Can you guys still hear me okay? Yeah, it's good. Oh, cool. So I'm um, kind of moving beyond uh, jobs to be done. A different approach of framing problems is called people problems. And people problems are essentially uh, needs and issues as they might be articulated by regular people. Um, this is just kind of like a way of saying, you know, anytime you talk about a problem or frame a problem, it should always go back to users. And it should be articulated in a very simple humanistic way that isn't like packed full of jargon or um, too kind of like specific or prescriptive on a particular feature or product. Um, the value in people problems is that they help identify progress that people are trying to make in their daily lives and define what is broken or unsatisfying about their current solutions. So you'll see a trend here between both these frameworks where you know you don't want to focus on a specific feature or a specific product. You want to highlight the actual solution, sorry, the actual outcomes, because it's the best way to come up with the absolute best solution and not just like whatever is most obvious for the team. Um, so five kind of like good guiding principles on how to frame people problems is People problems should be human, simple, and straightforward, and very easily understandable by anyone without a tech background. They should be solutions agnostic, meaning they should not kind of have a bias or inclination towards a particular solution or executional kind of outcome. Um, they should be agnostic of business metrics and wins. And what this means is that, um, your problem should not be hinged on achieving certain business outcomes that should come afterwards. Like I truly believe that if you build a good product that, sell, that solves real user problems, your business will be successful. So um, highly recommend that when you do frame repeal problems, like they're not tied to the business. Like that should be like a PM's job or it should be in like a process that comes afterwards. Um, the fourth point here is uh, you want to focus on understanding observed phenomenon. And what this means is um, a lot of the times when you analyze the user behavior in your app, you'll see like a lot of um, what I call maladaptive user patterns, which basically mean 
uh, user patterns and behaviors that are very inefficient. And usually they're inefficient because they're trying to do like a hacky workaround or they're confused about a particular thing. So if you did like a click stream analysis for your app and you see like a lot of people are going back and forth between two screens, that is like a sign to me that, you know, there's a maladaptive user behavior here. And that's like an observed phenomenon that should tie back to like a people problem that would kind of like help articulate and frame it in a way that makes it easier to be solved with your team. <clears throat> Sorry. And then lastly, um, you want your people problem to be functional, emotional, or social, one of those three. Uh, and again, this is like trying to disassociate it from the business metrics because that's really not like the goal or point at this stage in the project. Uh, pausing for questions. Yeah, we have one, another question from Jaden. Um, are there any cases where it is appropriate to limit your job story to a specific scope of solution medium? Uh, for example, if you're working for a company that currently specializes in SaaS products, is it appropriate to limit, uh, to limit your scope to software solutions or sh should you still be considering all mediums, for example, hardware? Um, that's honestly a really, really good solution, good question. And it depends on like, you know, the scope of your team and how much resources you have. You know, if you're Facebook, you can basically do any opportunity that comes up because you have the capacity for it. If you're a really small startup and most of your expertise is in, you know, um, you know, software, you probably don't want to deviate into hardware unless you have like a cash injection or something in your roadmap that'll enable that. That being said, uh, there is like a concept that I will cover in the next couple slides talking about when you should revisit decisions. So um, generally, like if you identify an opportunity, you probably want to like log it in some sort of backlog and then set a specific reminder on like, you know, if we raise more money or if this day happens or our main business performance drops under a certain threshold, we might want to re-explore other opportunities. And then at that point, you want to make sure that all your other ideas that might not have made sense at that time um, are still formatted in a way that allows you to pick them back up at a later date when it does make sense to. So um, yeah, the advice is that you want to log it somehow and then figure out a way or framework or tripwire to set like a reminder to pick it back up when you know it becomes more feasible for the business. <clears throat> okay. uh, we have another question from Anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, so when working with high level stakeholders who are sometimes adamant about prescribing certain solutions, how do you align your team to build what's best for the product? Yeah, that's great. So like, first of all, like any exec or leadership person that prescribes a solution <clears throat> unless you're like some like next level visionary, generally not a good advice to just like follow them blindly. And I know like as a junior designer, that could be hard, but like kind of like take the advice that I mentioned like thus far, align with them on the exact problem that they're trying to solve. Like, you know, if an exec is like, oh, we should build an app for music, let's say, you should push back and be like, you know, don't say no, just push back and ask. Um, you know, what goal are we trying to achieve? Like what user problem are we trying to solve? And they might say something like, oh, like we want more engagement for this sister product. And then you want to align on kind of like the metric for that. It's like, oh, um, you know, do you, um, let's say the metric would be like session duration uh, per month or something like that. Um, that basically gives you like a very objective measurement that ties to the goal, which you ideally would have aligned on with leadership. And then that basically gives you permission and flexibility to explore uh, alternative solutions. And then using that to kind of like map that to the um, metric and goal that you've already agreed on at a high level. And then it's an opportunity for growth for you to say like, hey, like, I know this was your idea. We tried it. Um, we don't think it solves this goal because this metric or performance metric that we agreed on is relatively low. However, based off all these other inputs and explorations, we have you know, this other solution that we think might do a lot better 
because like, you know, it has like a higher kind of metric outcome that aligns with the goal here. And we think we should go with this. And typically at that point, like if you've already aligned in the goal and the metric and, you know, it just comes down to like one number being higher, it's really, really hard to refute. And then speaking from personal experience, like all the executives and leadership people that I've worked with, anytime they prescribe a solution, they're not being as literal as you think. Um, a lot of the times, like leadership, they're very high level. They're focused on, you know, like five, 10 year visions. And they might have like an idea, but it's mostly just like a guiding thought. You don't need to take it um, into like that much consideration. If you have like other solutions you believe in more, it's more about like how you frame it and how you kind of like just say like, hey, like, you know, we've agreed on this already, but this like objectively performs better on this metric that we aligned with. And you're usually able to like influence them on the other kind of direction then. And also like, if you are able to accomplish this, like as, especially as a junior designer, like it shows like tremendous, tremendous impact for the product and a lot of career growth. And honestly, it's the easiest way to get promoted from like junior to intermediate is when you can start actually pushing back on prescribed solutions, identifying the business need defining a metric and then coming up with something that's objectively better and like almost like ir irrefutable if that makes sense yeah that's great <clears throat> um we have another question from jung mm -hmm. um how would this apply to products that are attempting to simply digitize an existing process rather than finding a new market to capitalize on um, so that's a really good question as well. So in that recommend, in that kind of scenario, I usually recommend building a, a baseline and I kind of touched on this earlier, but it's like leveraging a lot of the existing patterns and frameworks that exist, building out like an MVP that doesn't make a lot of, you know, extreme assumptions and how things might work better, but more like what's safe, use that as a baseline, get that out the door ASAP. And then, um, think about aspects of the product that you want to optimize in what order. And usually the framework I use is called the R metrics, which stands for like acquisition, activation, <clears throat> retention, revenue, referral. And that kind of like refers to like a funnel and set of metrics that you should be prioritizing depending on the stage of your product. So um, let's say you've built all your MVP, you have baseline measures for like every step of the funnel. Um, you might see that, okay, like act, acquisitions doing really well, activations doing really well, but it kind of like falls off short on the uh, retention part of the funnel, then you would basically want to come up with like a lot of new ideas, um, specifically targeting and optimizing the metrics related to retention, and then running a lot of uh, split or A-B tests to basically figure out the best kind of implementation for that particular metric. Um, so it's just about like kind of like building a foundation first really quickly and then pinpointing the exact parts of your experience that you need to optimize more and then being more diligent there. And I think from then on, you can apply like most of what I said. Does that answer your question? I, don't, I can't see the comments, so. Oh, uh, yeah, so if that answers your question, it's good. Um, mm -hmm. If you have a follow-up question, just uh, ask another question. But yeah, <clears throat> it should be good for, for now. Cool. Um, so um, kind of like when you implement people problems, uh, there's different things you do depending on the phase of the project. Generally at the beginning of a project, you wanna use people problems to get uh, different people on your team, both internal and external aligned at a very high level, like this is what we're trying to solve. Um, and during execution, you wanna use people problems to remain on track and to prevent scope creep and also weigh trade-offs. So um, a lot of the times it's very easy once you get into like the executional phase of a project to be like very, very like tunnel vision in. And it's very easy to like deviate away from like the original goal if you don't kind of like use people problems and like uh, kind of rein people in and keep people on track. Um, scope creep is basically when people just start adding like additional small features that uh, they think might help, but they don't really consider how it impacts the product holistically and whether or not it makes sense to do it at this time. And also if it makes sense um, from like a prioritization perspective. Um, 
And then also a lot of times like there's trade-offs that you'll make, especially between different disciplines. So you want to make sure that you can use really well-crafted uh, people problems or even job to be done uh, job stories to kind of help uh, weigh trade-offs objectively against like a common criteria. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm having a really dry throat right now. And then lastly here for post-launch, you want to use people problems to evaluate and reset. So what that means is you want to figure out, like, this is a core kind of people problem that we set out to solve at the beginning. Once the product is built, you want to take back and just, like, very honestly reflect on <clears throat> whether or not that solution actually did solve the problem you set out to solve. And, you know, if you do it properly, ideally there's no deviation, but sometimes... Um, you'll come into situations where people might use your product it, uh, and then using like different unintended kind of like uses for your product, in which case you haven't solved your problem or there might be some like logistical or infrastructural issues that prevent like full adoption. Like usually this is an opportunity for you to like very kind of like objectively reconsider on whether or not the product is still going in the right direction and if it's solving the attended kind of uh, <clears throat> intended uh, problem that you set out at the beginning. Sorry, I need a sneeze. Any questions from the audience? <clears throat> uh, not, not any yet. Someone wish you get well soon though. I think it's allergies. Um, I think when you get old, allergies come up for no reason. I never had allergies before, so I'm a little shook. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, framing the problem. So once everyone's aligned on the actual problem that we're trying to solve, the rationale behind uh, trade-offs and decisions become much more obvious. So I kind of mentioned this earlier, but, you know, every discipline will be kind of like focused on their own kind of metrics, like designs on user experience, PM is on business outcomes, and just on performance and scalability. They're all thinking about different problems, and, you know, they're always going to have different opinions. But if you've aligned on a high-level problem and a metric, then you'll find that um, when you're kind of like having conversations about compromises and trade-offs, you're kind of like speaking like a common language and um, you know, you're evaluating against the same criteria. And then, um, you know, when you have to like debate between A and B, it's a lot easier to get that alignment because like the high level alignment is already there. I think I saw a question, so I'll pause. I think someone raised their hand. <clears throat> Oh, sorry, um, say that again, they froze. Oh, I think somebody raised their hand. I think somebody might have a question. Oh. Oh, there's a bunch. Oh, it was by accident. <laughs> mm. It's all good. So, um... One kind of like additional thought to leave you here with is um, it's very, very, very critically important for designers to be very good at decision making and influencing the team around certain decisions because on most projects, you are the only designer. And if you don't advocate for the user, literally nobody else will. So like typically like this is hard because I feel like anecdotally, a lot of designers I've met uh, they're more introverted and like they're less confrontational. This is definitely something that you need to overcome uh, in your career because, you know, I talked about every discipline having their own, pers own perspective. And although like a lot of companies are being more progressive and coming around to the importance and value of UX, you can't really assume that anyone is going to advocate users like instead of you, like it's always going to be the designer or user researcher that really needs to kind of have that voice for the user and kind of like act as a check and balance uh, with like, you know, business outcomes and scalability and 
other kind of like non-design, non-UX perspectives, because that's always going to be there. So um, it's very beneficial for every designer to kind of start developing this type of skill set and this perspective and get really comfortable talking and pushing back and disagreeing um, in favor of the user because, you know, a lot of the times in any org throughout your career, you're going to be the only person. And if you kind of like join design or you started your career in design to like, you know, do good and help people in the world and stuff, uh, this is kind of like the main thing that you need to do. <clears throat> so uh, kind of cycling through here, um, defending in terms of defending decisions, like your job is to disambiguate the problem as much as possible be involved in the roadmap scope and product spec discussions within your team. Try and think about um, how you articulate your thoughts and rationale from other discipline perspectives. Align on the problem and create product principles at a high level. This kind of is like a secondary step after aligning on um, the high level problem and also the metric. You want to also create principles if you feel like it's gonna be like a very massive project or something that's gonna be ongoing for a long time. And then lastly, um, have more confidence. Like you are not really a junior designer. There's a lot of value that junior designers bring to the table. So never have that kind of inferiority complex that prevents you from speaking up. Because when you leave university and join a team, even if you're a junior designer, like on paper, um, you're going to be paired with like managers and like very senior people in other disciplines and you need to have a strong voice. So try and, you know, overcome that inferiority complex or imposter syndrome as early as possible and like just contribute your thoughts. Even if you're wrong, it's going to be hella awkward at the beginning, but really, really fight through. Like, trust me, this is going to be by far kind of the most important skill to develop. Um, assuming everything else checks out, like this is going to be the most important thing in terms of like kind of leveling up past senior. <clears throat> um, and then kind of like just an extension of the assumption validation, like the same principles do apply for decision-making. The only kind of last point to add here is like you wanna pick the right battles. You can't disagree with everything. You can't be adversarial. You need to think about like which decisions um, need like really really strong representation and what decisions you have a really firm stance on and some decisions are less important you should kind of like um let's well, slide for now or propose like a v1 v2 three usually uh, uh engine pmr are a lot more receptive to v1s and then you can slide in like subsequent improvements into v2s and v multi-cell test and you just like test all of them and get like actual quantifiable data. <clears throat> I know we're out of time so I'm gonna rush but let me know if you need to cut me off. Um, so the best ways to get involved in decision making as a junior designer is you want to champion certain initiatives that can help increase decision making context or accelerate career growth. Um, what this means is that um, you might not be involved in a lot of strategic decisions earlier, but you want to make sure that um, <clears throat> you raise your hand and volunteer to you know, like uh, take notes or like propose like certain um, solutions and um, formats and meetings and processes, um, particularly the two that I'm going to cover now, uh, the Kana model and also decision logs and tripwires. I'll try and blast through these really quickly. But um, the Kana model is basically a more user-centric approach for scoping and defining product requirements. Uh, the Kana model helps determine the right amount of resource investment into a particular feature for optimal user satisfaction. And then um, this is better than a lot of the existing frameworks because uh, they use impact as a factor. Um, which isn't ideal because in practice, like impact is very ambiguous and tends to focus on business value rather than user value. So I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen these diagrams before. Um, this is kind of the old way of prioritizing different features. Um, they usually use a matrix or a table or a simple calculation where it's just a factor of the effort and the impact. However, as I mentioned before, this doesn't really work because those two are very ambiguous and uh, hard to actually estimate until you actually build it. 
So uh, a better framework is actually using the Kano model, which divides different features into um, basic, performance, the lighter, reversal, and indifferent. And they all follow like, different like trends and patterns on this diagram or shape um, that kind of inform like how much resources you should be investing. So I realized that um, I'm only about two thirds of the presentation through and I know this was scheduled for like an hour. So um, I don't know if you guys can like pull the audience and ask if they want me to like blast through the rest or kind of keep going through things in the same amount of detail. Um, what, what do you I feel think, like Joe? you should be good to continue going? Okay. Yeah, people are saying keep going. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, hopefully this is helpful. I, I'm like trying to like be very thorough, but I realize it's kind of elongating the duration of the session. <clears throat> cool. Okay, so I'll kind of talk about this in more detail. I honestly think it's like the one of the best uh, frameworks ever for any designer to really understand. Um, there is essentially like a process or a questionnaire that people fill out that helps you categorize like different features into one of these uh, five categories. So a basic feature, you can see like, uh, sorry, taking a step back, uh, on the x-axis you have um, degree of functionality. Uh, this basically refers to resource investment. So it ranges from not, de not delivered, meaning you don't build a feature out at all, to fully delivered, meaning you fully build out a feature with all the bells and whistles. Y access is basically just ranging from dissatisfaction to satisfaction. So basically the uh, net impact on the UX. And <clears throat> here with the first type of feature, basic features, you can see that um, it has a relatively binary effect on user satisfaction. What that means is that as soon as you build the feature, um, people are generally happy, but continually basically investing into the feature doesn't actually have that much of a return on investment from a satisfaction perspective. And usually what this means is that as, soon as, as long as this feature exists, you don't need to invest beyond that. So typically your MVP of any product is going to be composed entirely of basic features. And um, generally, in identifying basic features, um, users will never tell you they want a basic feature. It's an expectation. So what that means is that <clears throat> um, they're not really going to notice if you have it, but if you're missing this feature, they're going to be really, really pissed off and like not really like use your product at all. So a common example would be um, Let's say you had um, like a video streaming app on your phone. Um, when you're kind of like downloading a video streaming app and you're looking at the different like app store profiles, you're gonna be looking for like certain features that you want, but you're never gonna ask or specifically look out for things like, oh, can you control the volume? You would never ask that because you just assume that a volume control should be built into this product and therefore that's a basic feature. Conversely, if they built like a very bare bones volume picker or volume slider versus building like the most sophisticated volume slider on the market that can, you know, attenuate to like a fraction of a, uh, I don't know, like X position slider, um, you're not really going to notice the difference. Like it's going to have like the same amount of satisfaction on your user experience. So um, generally, like these features are used to kind of identify MVPs and also to call out that, you know, like once you build out the MVP version of this feature, we probably shouldn't invest that much more time and resources into making it better. <clears throat> Performance features are basically features that you always want to invest in no matter what. And these are features that are going to be very obvious, things that um, your audience will always tell you. And Going back to that video streaming app example, things like quality, loading times, amount of content available, these are things that are gonna have like a very linear relationship with user satisfaction, meaning the more you have, the better. And these are features that you always wanna continuously invest in. <clears throat> and then uh, third, there's the lighter features. Basically what this means is that these are features that are kind of like really big differentiators between you and what's out there in the market. 
Um, any feature you have here, um, you're not going to expect, but once you do have it, it's going to have a very exponential kind of um, impact and user satisfaction to delight. Um, usually these are kind of referred to as like aha moments or like really, really like um, <clears throat> moments of like delight and surprise when you discover like a feature of functionality that you didn't think would work or you didn't expect to be there, but you're really pleasantly surprised that it does work. Um, and generally, like, this only has this, like, exponential gain on user satisfaction, assuming that your basic performance features are covered. Um, one thing to also kind of, like, note is that there's something called the uh, natural decay of delight for a lot of features. And what this means is that as your competitors kind of get better and as te technological advances occur in your industry, uh, the expectations for consumers are always going to increase and things that used to be really surprising, groundbreaking a couple years ago might just be come like performance or basic features a couple years later. A very common example is like the first smartphone or the first like iPhone. Um, when they introduced uh, multi gesture support, meaning the ability to tap on more than one thing at a time, that was considered like a groundbreaking innovation. But nowadays, that would be considered more of a basic feature because um, you know every smartphone user would expect multi-gesture support at a minimum. <clears throat> oh my god, I'm like dying. It's okay to be nervous. I think my throat's just really dry. I've been talking all day. Um, so wrapping up here, uh, reversal features are basically features where um, you've really fucked you've really messed up your market research and uh, you basically like somehow flipped user requirements in your head and you built a feature that actually actively decreases um, user satisfaction. A common example here is ads. So you wanna be very careful about how much ads you inject into your ad, into your product and at what places. Um, typically, you know, uh, if you add like paywalls and like, you add uh, ads and sponsored posts to your product, those are all gonna be considered reversal features. So if you do plan to add those in at any point for monetization purposes, you wanna be very careful about how you balance it relative to other features in development. And then lastly, number five are indifferent features. And those are basically features where, um, you know, nobody really needs it. And regardless of whether or not you build it, to what degree and to what extent, it doesn't have any impact at all on uh, user satisfaction. So this is more like a really high level overview of this concept. It's a lot more in depth and probably could talk about this for like four hours, but uh, there is a resource in the appendix I'll link out that has a very comprehensive tutorial on how to use and leverage this pattern. And then I kind of also mentioned that as a junior designer, if you see that your team is still prioritizing features using the very classic impact X uh, effort ratio uh, approach, it's an opportunity here for you to kind of propose and teach your team this framework and then volunteer to kind of like lead or contribute to it um, as like a way to career, career growth and also get involved in decision making because this is like one of the really powerful frameworks that really help um, illustrate the value of design and decision making within an org. <clears throat> Pausing for questions. Yeah, so we have a question from Anonymous. Um, how do you actually utilize the Cano model in practice? Do you yeah. use the framework in brainstorming slash ideation sessions with cross-functional partners? Um, so I think like this could be used at any point during a product development cycle. So the two most common use cases that I've used this model for is when I'm in a design sprint trying to develop like a new product opportunity and we're trying to figure out the roadmap and initial scope, uh, we'll use the basic features and some performance features to build the MVP. And then uh, as we build it out, uh, we'll add in, you know, delighter features into the next iteration, next phase and um, kind of figure out, you know, the order of features that we need to build. Generally, it goes from, <clears throat> generally it goes from basic to performance and then to the lighter. And that's like the process that most people follow. 
Um, <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> Thanks, sorry. Um, the second kind of like strong use case for this is um, when you're doing like an audit of an existing product that hasn't been like updated or touched in a long time, um, you want to kind of like look at your product holistically and see how it stacks up to competitors in the market. And also to kind of like analyze like all your features, like an inventory of, you know, all your basic features, performance features, the layer features, and see like to what extent they've been built and whether or not you need more resource investment into a particular feature, or you know, like if there's any basic or performance features you haven't covered well enough, and if so, then you know, what delay or features you can focus on. So it really helps like inform roadmaps and also identify gaps in the product experience. Does that answer your question? I believe so, but if there was any other clarifying questions, definitely feel free to ask more. Um, we have another one. Mm -hmm. Uh, from Jaden, uh, how do you justify the Candle model's prioritization of user satisfaction over business impact to executives or business analysts? Yeah, so that's difficult to be honest. Um, but like, I feel like we're seeing kind of like a shift in industry to kind of like illustrate like the value that design brings to a business. Like we've seen like a lot of businesses that are designed first being really successful, like you know Airbnb, Uber. Um, and even like a lot of VC firms are hiring designers as like strategic partners. So um, I feel like in the next couple of years or half a decade, um, like good design is going to equate to good business. I think that's actually literally a quote by a really famous like VC or designer or tech person. Like good design is good business. And hopefully you're in an org that like understands that or values that. If not, you might need to do some additional work to like tie user satisfaction with the business. And the most common way is usually like, if we improve user satisfaction, retention should go up, um, referral should go up. So, you know, things like net promoter score, like that should go up. And that translates into increased lifetime value of a customer. And that should be a very standard kind of like association that most uh, non-designers should know. But if not, like you can, definitely do some pretty simple research and justification for that link. That's perfect. Cool, moving on. <clears throat> so the next kind of technique, a bit different from the Kana model, but it's more like um, how to kind of like follow up on decisions. And that's to basically do something called a decision, decision log. <coughs> decision log, which is used to record the important decisions a team made for a project. Um, so believe it or not, in industry, a lot of the times when there's no clear owner or host for a meeting, people will talk about like a bunch of decisions, but you know, it's like not logged anywhere. And by the time the team resyncs or regroups, people might've like misinterpreted a decision or forgot a decision. And it just gets like really messy and just results in like a lot of like thrash within the team. So the best way to kind of like tackle this is to create a decision log. And as a junior designer, you can introduce the concept of a decision log to the team and then volunteer to be like that note taker. And that's a very easy way for you to kind of like slide into like some of the higher level strategic and leadership meetings. Generally, the things that you want to include in a decision log is kind of like create a table and have the date, the attendees or the people who have contributed to a decision, the exact decision that was made, and then also your rationale, basically listing out the supporting evidence, assumptions, and the validations. And then lastly, you also want to include optionally something called a tripwire, which I'll cover here. <clears throat> So I've kind of touched on this topic before, but tripwire is something that is attached to a specific decision. And it's basically a trigger to act or rethink a decision when a set of conditions, usually date or metric becomes true. 
So what this means is that, you know, generally if you followed all the tips I laid here, you are making the best decisions based off the information that you do have at a given point in time. However, circumstances, especially in tech, will always change. So you're gonna end up in scenarios where, you know, new information comes in or like, you know, COVID happens and you pivot. And a lot of the assumptions that you previously needed to make a decision is no longer true. And then the tripwire acts as like a signal for you to go back and rethink, does this decision still make sense? Should we keep going or should we stop, pivot and rethink? <clears throat> and generally uh, that comes in the form of, you know, we decided to do X at this date. However, if Y becomes true, we need to revisit whether or not we should continue with X. So this is just like a generally a good practice to have because it avoids uh, present bias and also like the whole like autopilot effect of uh, just kind of like going down the same path because you're kind of like tunnel visioned in. And then uh, you also kind of avoid the risk of sacrificing long-term impact for short-term benefits. And this also helps uh, significantly reduce the perception of thrash within a team. Um, to those who don't know, uh, thrash basically refers to like, you know, like kind of flip-flopping the decisions or like miscommunication, basically anything that makes your workflow or process very ineffective in the team. If you have like, um, if you're in a, in a situation where, you know, the team decided on doing something, but your team keeps like pivoting or changing their minds or going in different directions, um, assuming those decisions were made like with good intent, um, having a very, very well documented decision log with tripwires will help the rest of the team understand why you're making a pivot because usually, ideally, you should be making a pivot based off tripwires. Um, pausing for questions as I catch my breath. Um, there seems to be no questions at the moment. Okay. There were um, previous questions um, for a different part in the presentation. Um, one of them is, out of curiosity, could you bring up an example in your career where you really had to advocate for a user? Yeah, that's a good question. I think like any time you're in a very like eng-driven company, um, don't want to throw any names, but let's say you are, um, you're gonna have like engineers be like, hey, like the solution's gonna take too long to build. It's not gonna be worth it. Where you have, you're gonna have like PMs. You're like, hey, like how do we extract the most like money or short-term value from this customer without considering long-term needs? And you know, it's gonna be hard. And there's no way it's like give like a cookie cutter template like response that's gonna resolve these. But a lot of it has to deal with like people. Um, so for me, like earlier on in my career, like I proposed a solution that I truly believe would be the best user experience. But uh, the engineering lead at that time, super, super senior, like 20 years older than me, 20 years more experience was like, I don't want to do this. this is a bad idea because it's going to cost us an extra two months in development time. And then I was faced with like a really hard decision because, you know, two months is a lot. It's like, potentially like tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of development out, development costs um, added onto the project. So um, I basically had to like figure out like, okay, what does this engineer care about? And um, you know, there's gonna be some cliches for like different disciplines, but like this particular engineer um, truly did want the best for the business, but his perspective was that, you know, if we take an extra two months to bring this product to market, um, we're going to lose like first movers advantage and we're not going to be able to actually um, help the people we need um, if there is no product, right? So like his perspective obviously made sense. And then what I did was like, all right, like let's figure out a way to still provide the best amount of experience without adding too much additional dev time and get the V1 out by this date. So, you know, it meets your requirement in your mind. Um, but let's also align and agree that, you know, uh, two months after launch, once like the build is stabilized, we spent our very first sprint uh, retackling this problem and coming up with a better long-term solution. So that was like the compromise I arrived at. And a lot of that had to do with like understanding other perspectives and also being flexible. 
However, um, there were also some scenarios where I had to deal with like, let's say a PM and they were saying like, hey, like this is how we should do our monetization model. And then I truly believed based off the research I, I had conducted that if we were to do this monetization model, we would literally have like zero users or like nobody would buy this product. So um, in that sense, like we couldn't really like do a V1 or MVP using his solution. So essentially like we agreed on the high level goal, the uh, benchmarks and the metrics that we wanted to set. And then we just did a form of testing with both our variations to kind of get a sense of, um, you know, what would perform better and use like objective metrics to kind of sell that debate. And you'll find that in your career in industry, like in school, you learn a lot about usability testing being like kind of the main thing. But a lot of the times like you're gonna have like very unique scenarios where you need to come up with like a new UXR method or a new test or combine like two existing tests to get the exact validation that you need. And that will usually come with experience. But I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I think so. Um, another question from Anonymous, it's super random, but why are tripwires called tripwires? Never heard of this term before. Yeah, um, it actually is a real term. If you look it up, like type in tripwire decision making, you'll see like a lot of articles about it. But um, so it's actually a funny, like this is how I think about it in my head. So you know how like in tech you have sprints, right? And they're sprints because they're very focused and you're running in one direction at full speed. A lot of the times, like, you might run off a cliff if you're not considering, like, uh, the changes around you. So a tripwire is literally, like, as its name, it's meant to, like, trip you if you're going too far. So I kind of, like, see tripwires as, like, little boundaries to make sure that, you know, as you kind of develop a product, you're going to go in many different directions. But the tripwire is going to set that outer bound to make sure you don't run off that cliff, if that makes sense. I don't know if that was cheesy, but that's how I've always interpreted tripwires in my mind. Cool. All right, moving on. Um, um, some additional tips on just how to approach decision making and rallying in general is that, you know, as I mentioned before with my example, you want to understand the perspectives of other disciplines and learn how to speak their language, learn the tools um, and like the terminology that they use. Um, so for me, early in my career, it was actually learning a lot about data science and a lot about product and business. So that, you know, instead of just saying, hey, like this landing page will create a better user experience, I can be like, this landing page will likely uh, decrease the bounce rate and increase the conversion rate on the CTA by at least this amount, which will translate into this much actual revenue for the company. So although like the design solution I propose is exactly the same, um, just by learning like their perspective and their language, I'm able to like articulate a much more compelling argument for why my decision is better. Uh, the next kind of tip here is um, you wanna choose a right presentation method and format depending on who the audience is. Not every person is gonna be able to like understand like a user flow, like some people prefer prototypes, some people prefer slides, some people prefer like diagrams. Really try and cater the presentation method to uh, the exact audience, personality, and experiences of the team. And then um, the last few points is basically talking about how, you know, there's a lot of diversity in the way people think, especially in tech. Um, some people are more macro level, like they think high level first and then they drill down to specifics. Some people are more uh, micro bottom up approach, meaning they um, start at like a very specific thing and then gradually they work, work their way up to like a high level concept. Um, try and identify like the type of thinker your audience is and accommodate or change your narrative accordingly to kind of match that. <clears throat> so um, I kind of mentioned that I would like kind of list out some resources or kind of things for you guys to like look into if you want to kind of further expand your knowledge on this topic. Um, in decision making and um, kind of like defending your decisions, like it is a lot of like arguments sometimes and 
it's really beneficial to understand logical fallacies and how to work around them because it does happen a lot in industry and like just being really good at kind of identifying logical fallacies and avoiding logical fallacies will make it much easier for you to communicate your ideas without other people poking holes into kind of like your vision. Um, definitely also research a lot into decision-making science, decision thinking, look up design charrettes. It's a really helpful exercise for design thinking. Um, do some research into KPIs, North Star metrics, and surrogate measure, metrics or proxy metrics. Um, a really good book that I would recommend for decision science is called Farsighted by Steven Johnson. Um, also research influence diagrams and decision trees. These are both kind of really strong concepts that you can use on a more technical level to really disambiguate like a lot of complex ideas. And then lastly here, uh, this is a really, really good uh, link that I found uh, that has like a full end-to-end -end tutorial on the condom model. Um, and then the last quote I kind of leave you guys with is uh, great designers not only need to make good decisions, but they need to defend their decisions on behalf of the user and rally the team behind a compelling product vision that solves real user problems. <clears throat> Butcher that quote, but that's kind of the essence of this presentation. So uh, I'm gonna pause for questions. Um, and if there aren't any, I have kind of two slides on general career tips for new designers to get into. Um, I also yeah. really quickly need to use the washroom, so give me 10 seconds. I'll <laughs> <laughs> he was drinking a lot of water. Okay. We do have um, some questions, and if you have any other questions, feel free to Ask away. So sorry. No, it's all good. It's all good. Okay, so we did have two questions. Um, so the first one was, actually we have three questions now. Uh, do you have any tips on how to set appropriate conditions for tripwires or does it just come with practice? Yeah, um, so there's two kind of really important things that come with tripwires. The first one is to assign an owner to check up on it at like set intervals. And usually the person that disagrees with that decision the most will volunteer or you can volunteer them to be the owner for that tripwire. And then second of all, um, I mentioned the two most common conditions for triggering a tripwire is a certain date and also a certain metric that drops or it falls within a certain threshold, um, i.e., you know, like three months from now or next quarter, reevaluate the decision or when our conversion rate drops between, you know, two percent, um, we should reevaluate the decision. So uh, generally, I know Slack has a lot of Slack bots that can integrate and like set you know timed reminders and also metric-based reminders. So that's usually a good format. There is no best way. It really depends on the kind of working relationship you have with your team. Perfect. Uh, the second question was, how do you push back on spontaneous feature suggestions from the CEO without seeming or without seeming like idea like an idea blocker when you're the only designer in a startup without much of a designer culture? Um, that's hard. Um, you'll see this in my career advice afterwards, but you know some companies are not that great for career growth, especially if you have especially if it's not like a design driven culture or if you're the only designer or you have like kind of a dictator-ish CEO, unfortunately. Um, the best advice I can give you is that 
if you say no to something, you should have alternative solutions. Like the final recommendation shouldn't be to not build anything. It should be to build this instead. And I kind of mentioned this earlier, but like you want to like really double down and align with that person. And maybe it's not the CEO. Maybe it's what the CEO rep um, has reporting to them to kind of align like what is the goal? Like why does the CEO want this specific feature? Um, and then and kind of like keep asking why until you get to the root cause. And then once you understand the root cause, reframe it as like a job to be done or a people problem. Get alignment on that, get alignment on a metric, and then treat that as more of a open-ended design prompt for you um, to figure out. So instead of like, how do you build it? How do you design this feature? It should be like, now that I know this new goal, is that CEO's like feature suggestion the best idea? Or do I think I can come up with something better specifically for this goal? And usually the answer is yes. Okay. That was great. Um, this next question is from Anonymous. Um, aside from methodologies in practice, sometimes your engineer or PM counterparts may not just come to your meeting or don't listen to you because you're a junior or new to the company and your design decisions hold little power. How can we overcome such tricky situations? That's hard. Um, I don't know, is leaving an option? I feel like everyone should be leaving every one to three years. Um, that, that's a shitty situation to be in. Um, hopefully, ideally, you have at least a manager or somebody to report into that you can escalate the situation to. Um, and some there's kind of, yeah, so there's two ways to approach it, or three ways. The first way is um, go up to your manager, and hopefully your manager is supportive. Talk about these issues. Talk about, you know, um, talk about, like, what you want to do, why you want to accomplish it, and how it's going to be beneficial, and what's blocking you. But you want to frame it in, like, almost like a slightly more political way. You want to make sure that, you know, you're not throwing anyone under the bus, you're not being adversarial, but frame it, like use a lot of we's and also frame it in like, you know, how can we come up with like a better working relationship? Like what can you do to, you know, make their lives easier? Maybe for you, that's like creating an agenda or sending over a pre-read or changing the structure of the meeting format, or maybe you should be, um, you know, following like proper meeting etiquette, like you should be messaging them like a day in advance but like hey like can you come to this meeting this is what i need from you here's like the context you need a lot of it is like i think a lot of people don't realize how important it is to like prepare for a meeting as a host usually for me like when i skip a meeting where i see coworkers skip a meeting it's because the meeting was not prepared properly so you know make sure you have an agenda make sure you're paying the attendees in advance Make sure you're marking the optional attendees as optional and, you know, be very intentional and specific about, you know, what you need from them, why you need it from them and how it's going to help the project and make sure everyone attending has like enough context to really uh, contribute in the way that you want them to. So that's the first solution. The second solution is, um, sorry, I forgot my second solution. Uh, so the first one is to structure your meeting properly. Oh, I, th I think I combined them, yeah. Structure your meeting properly, escalate it to your manager if not possible. The third, honestly, like if you're in a situation where um, you don't have like a lot of uh, support from uh, your from leadership and from your manager and designs like not a well-respected like kind of discipline that has a seat at the table, um, you, might want to reconsider looking for like a different opportunity like honestly like from experience talking with like a lot of people and even for myself i know usually it's not worth it to wait it out waiting for a culture to change it's much easier for you to find a different opportunity that does have the culture and does have the environment to really give you what you need to excel uh there's nothing wrong with that but you know don't kind of be super stubborn and like think that you know you have to be a lifer at this company or you need to stay for like x number of years sometimes the best decision is to move um and then lastly um if you're brand new to a company um you know a lot of it is trust 
um, trust needs to be built. Like everyone that gets hired in our company has like a very base, but probably a low level of trust. As you demonstrate like your value and expertise and your knowledge, your title and whole OGR shouldn't matter. Um, so like, you know, if you're really new to a company, it's worth kind of developing your rapport with like the team for a few months before considering like, you know, leaving or any other the any of the other more extreme options. So make sure you have enough trust, you're structuring your meetings properly, escalate to your manager, and worst case scenario, you should leave. So I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> That's awesome. Um, and the last question comes from Sabine. Um, I am interested in your experience of se starting several startups on the side. How did you manage that and how could, and could you talk about that? Um, yeah, so generally like, the first couple of years of my career, like I never took, I never turned down like any design opportunity that I thought, you know, would help me build and launch like a real product. So um, a lot of them were just kind of like freelance projects that turned into like more of a co-founder um, relationship. Like all, all of my side projects I've done kind of uh, part-time while working full-time. And it just depends on like what you want and what you prioritize. Um, for me, like I just wanted like a lot of diverse experiences and I wanted uh, more experiences with the business. And like, I was very into like passive income generation. So a lot of my businesses were focused on that. Um, generally like um, the approach is like, you know, you find like a, like a pain point that you think you can solve, you look at the market, see if existing solutions solve it, and if you can do a better job. Um, and then you look at the size of the market, see what the opportunity is. Like, can you do it full-time or is it more passive generation? And then that'll let you know like how big your team can be and what your runway is. And after that, it's just like continued iteration and development as you kind of scale out. Um, for most of my startup experiences, I just ended up like exiting or like it's just, like generating passive income because that's like the goal I had. But depending on what you want to do, like maybe it's something that you want to work on passively and then like convert into like a full time venture. Like it's really up to you. But um, I touched on this framework before, but the framework that I always follow and how I tackle my startups is the R framework. Um, or it's A-A-R-R-R, -R -R. it's called the pirate metrics because pirates say R, but it's like a really famous VC that kind of developed this framework. And it's essentially telling you the order of priorities for what to invest your time and resources on. So it's, you know, the acquisition, activation, uh, retention, sorry, referral, sorry, uh, revenue, retention, revenue, referral. So you always want to like prioritize it in that sequence. And that's how I've done all my startups in the past. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, let me know if that was detailed enough or if any <clears throat> follow-up questions. Yeah, that was great. That's all the uh, questions for now. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so we're pretty much over time, but I thought since you guys are mostly in school, I'll drop some general career tips that were really helpful for me and basically things that I wish I knew if I was in your position. So uh, generally uh, for portfolios, aim for three case studies, four max, and make sure you cover all three major platforms, web, Android, iOS. Aim for a six to eight minute reading time on each case study and definitely do it in Google Docs or a word processor first before trying to build or code it. Um, I should highly recommend using Medium or Google Slides as a format. You don't need your own website and don't spend too much time trying to build a pretty website because um, unless you have like a lot of experience in front of development, your performance and loading times are gonna suffer. Um, and you're probably also adding in a lot more IA complexity that you don't need. Most recruiters spend like less than five minutes on your portfolio case study, probably less than a minute on each. So anytime they spend navigating or trying to load your site, it's time to not looking at your actual work. So you wanna optimize for that. Um, don't do cookie cutter portfolio templates. Like if you went to some sort of uh, design camp like BrainStation or something, they'll teach you like a very stepwise, you know, one, two, three, four, five kind of order of how you structure your portfolio. 
please don't do that. It's really, really bad. Uh, it's like a dead giveaway that you don't actually understand like the intention behind like different steps. Be very specific and intentional about each design artifact you're producing and how it's actually uh, contributing to your design decisions and how it's actually affecting the outcome. Don't do a persona just because you learned about it in school. It's very rarely used properly. Um, always prioritize uh, real projects that have shipped or are in the process of being developed. Um, the kind of like experience you get working with real developers to build a product will allow you to kind of develop like a lot of insight and expertise and the feasibilities and like different platform specific differences um, and also will open up like a lot of edge cases uh, and error states that you normally would never come across as a junior designer so it's very very important to for you to do like real projects and this is like much 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 more impactful than doing any sort of conceptual redesigns uh, no matter how detailed they are um, best advice here is to look into startups at incubators, so Velocity at Waterloo, um, and see if there's any startups that are like entirely edge driven that need design help. And that's usually an opportunity for you to, you know, volunteer or freelance with them to get like that real experience with the product. Um, and typically your design kind of um, skills don't need to be like that exceptionally high, especially if it's like at a student level. Um, you should also kind of think about product thinking, interaction design, and visual design as like the minimum table stakes to get any job in design nowadays. So it's okay to specialize and design has a luxury of being a very cross-disciplinary field that allows you to, you know, dig in so many different areas. But at a minimum, make sure these three main skill sets are covered before you dig too much into anything else. Um, and then generally when you start as a designer, uh, you don't want to be a specialist off the bat and you want to start off as a generalist, meaning you learn a little bit of everything. Um, and then eventually you want to pivot that into a T-shaped skill set where you're basically still a generalist, but you're very deeply specializing in one particular field. And that particular field doesn't necessarily need to be product, interaction, or visual. Just, those are just like the foundational pieces that you need. Um, and it's also okay to change focuses along the way. You don't need to kind of like set anything in stone early on. <clears throat> and then this is mostly just general advice on your first job. Your first job is exceptionally critical for your career growth and your trajectory. You wanna make sure that you start off strong and you pick the right opportunity for you. So the three kind of major uh, classifications of a design job are startup, corporate, or agency, and they all provide different growth opportunities. So you wanna make sure you pick the right ones and also do them in the right order. So at a very high level agencies, um, you get a lot of depth and you get very technical. Um, so you develop your technical craft skills really well, and that's interaction and visual, but very rarely product. Um, you're pretty much guaranteed to have senior mentorship, but usually it's lower pay and you don't get a lot of influence in product direction ownership. And typically uh, you end up kind of being a people pleaser. You end up trying to satisfy your, uh, your clients instead of creating the best UX. And sometimes that develops like maladaptive patterns or practices that aren't the best. Um, and generally, um, if you go from agency to either a startup or corporate, you usually get down leveled. Uh, for startups, you get a lot more breadth. You build all skills pretty evenly and develop a lot of new skills you've never tried before. Uh, but generally, you have less mentorship in startups because there's either no senior designer or the senior designers are really, really busy since it's going to be a small team. Uh, sometimes you might have poor product vision that you can't really influence. Um, but generally, like there's a lot more learning opportunities here. And I do recommend that most people at least try a startup near the end of their school year or uh, for their first job. And then corporate, um, it's kind of like a mix of both, medium depth, medium fidelity, uh, medium breadth, but the scope tends to be very narrow, especially for junior designers, so you won't work on anything super big. Um, usually get tons more money, but career growth is significantly slower and the transferable skills are very limited because 
a lot of big companies that have very like set ways of doing things that aren't industry standard or deviate away because they have very unique needs. And that's also why I don't recommend doing corporate for your first job. Um, but yeah, that is it. Uh, here are set of <clears throat> some of my social media handles if any of you guys want to follow my work. Um, but I'll kind of pause for more questions and if not, we can end here. Uh, we have one question and it's, what do you answer as your strengths and weaknesses at interviews? I don't think I've ever been asked that question to be honest. I think it's actually like a very old legacy question. You shouldn't be asking about weaknesses because I feel like there's no right way to answer that. Um, I think generally, if you are asked that question, you just want to be very <clears throat> specific about the additional skills you bring to the table outside of product interaction and visual. I kind of mentioned that those being the very basic table stakes required to get any job in design. Um, so you want to highlight like basically what you're good at, like in addition to those, or if you're very exceptionally good at one of those three things, um, more rare if you're a junior, but um, you want to have like really concrete examples there. And then you also want to highlight domain expertise. So um, if you're very knowledgeable about a particular domain or space that the, uh, the company is in, that's usually really valuable for you to highlight as well as a designer. Cool, uh, anything else? Um, is it good? Sorry, I froze for a second. Yeah, no worries. I was asking if there were any more questions left. <laughs> uh, no, that's all the, that looks like there's all the questions all right. that we have. <laughs> cool. All right. So thank you, Richard, for this talk. This is great. Um, if anyone has any other questions or anything like that, feel free to reach out uh, to Richard on all his social media. Um, give him a follow. And yeah, thank you so much, Richard, for coming yeah no worries yeah feel free to follow up with me as well if you guys have any questions Perfect. All right. see you everyone